Welcome to the Transformation Leaders Podcast. I'm Tony Lockwood and I'm delighted that you could join me on this latest episode. Each episode takes the form of a discussion with a leader who openly shares their experiences of leading organisations through the transformation journey. Today I'm delighted to welcome Jeffrey Deckman to the podcast. Jeffrey is a multiple international award winning thought leader and author on 21st century leadership mindsets, models and methods. He is the recipient of the 2021 Innovator and Thought Leader of the Year from the International Business Awards for his work around conscious leadership in action and the M3 process for leadership in organisation transformation. I'm sure you'll enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Well, uh, hi, Jeffrey. Uh, Welcome to the Transformation Leaders podcast. I'm delighted that you can join us today. I'm really interested in exploring uh, some of the key aspects uh, of the stuff that you cover in your best-selling book. Uh, I think it's called Developing the Conscious Leadership Mindset in the 21st Century. Uh, but but before we get into that, uh, let's start, as we always do, with introducing yourself, uh, letting, us, letting the listeners know a little bit about your background and how you moved into the change and transformation world in, in the first instance. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's, you know, I'm 66, so it's a really long story. <laughs> you know filled with drama and lions and tigers and bears etc but uh you know my my story is that uh you know I got out of high school I was not an academic learner I didn't do well uh in school uh and uh, in fact I had a, a full track scholarship that I refused to take because I didn't want to spend another 4 years in in an academic environment right. Uh, my father was in the cable television industry since 1951. Yeah. So I grew up around linemen and tower workers. And to me, they were like cowboys. Yeah. So when I got out of high school, I wanted to become a cowboy. So at the age of 17, I became a lineman on a cable television crew. And uh, over the next seven years, uh, I went from being a lineman to a tower worker and uh, a field engineer, and I had an opportunity to build some really large, sophisticated systems in Jersey, uh, in New Jersey. And then in 1981, I had learned enough, and I decided I wanted to start my own cable television construction and engineering firm. Wow! So I did that. I didn't know anything about business. Uh, I knew my trade, but I didn't know anything about business. And I partnered up with a couple of guys that did know some things about business. And we built that company uh, for seven years, offices in four states, 108 employees doing about four and a half million dollars of 1987 money. And uh, in 87, it crashed. And the reason it crashed was because we ended up building a company that was more complex to run then we knew how to to run and manage it. Yeah. Uh, off, if you've got a company with offices in four states, it's almost like you have four companies. Yeah. And we just got out over our skis and we made some mistakes that we couldn't recover from. So on the other side of that, uh, I could either have taken a job, which I, I was very hireable. You know, people knew me in my industry. Uh, or start another business. And I thought, well, starting another business is kind of ridiculous. I'm already going to be in debt from the other one. And, uh, but I thought, you know, if I, I was married at the time with, uh, with uh, one child and another one on the way. And I thought, if I take a job, I will never start another company. Yeah. If I start another company and that doesn't work, I can always go get the job. Uh, you know, it would be my second crash. I'd be in debt and that type of stuff. So, uh, the one choice, yeah, the one choice allowed me to, to keep two choices. So I started the second company and I changed industries from, from cable television to telecommunications. So that was in 1987, just as that industry was being born. So, uh, I stayed in that industry, built a successful integration company. We built large networks and, uh, college campuses, corporations, et cetera, copper fiber, coax, voice data, video systems. So I designed and built networks for 20 years, and I sold that company a week before its 21st birthday to my management team back in 2005. Uh, I'm happy to say that the the same people who bought it then still own it, and it's still going on. So a nice little legacy. And uh, the reason I sold that company was because I was bored with managing my business. I'm an entrepreneur. 
And I decided that I didn't want to just continue to kind of manage my company because the rapid growth had stopped. And I wanted to go and I wanted to help other people, small to medium sized business owners to build their company easier than I built mine with less, less failure, less stress. And uh, that's my passion. I love working with small to medium sized business owners, executives, et cetera, uh, and helping them get through those and navigate those pretty uh, treacherous waters that they can come up against. So, uh, yeah, I jumped out. I did that. I uh, in the meantime, I joined a, a partner in a think tank. And that was in 2007. And the reason I got into that was I wanted to see what type of cultural and societal changes were occurring because of the new millennium, which had just happened at that point, uh, and the really the, the massive impact technology was having on the world and in business. And I knew that we were getting out of the industrial age and getting into a knowledge and information age. So I wanted to know what type of new business processes and leadership models would we have to come up with to be able to be successful in this new world? Because the industrial age models just weren't going to work. And uh, so we needed something different. So that's what I've been doing over the last 17 years is developing some really sophisticated processes that uh, are very, very easy to operationalize, but they really focus on the new mindsets, models, and methods you need to be able to lead and, and build organizations in today's world. Uh, yeah, so that's my background. Along the way, I, I, I wrote the book, and uh, which I never thought I'd be able to write a book, but it came out and it's it's done well. It's Amazon bestseller and won two national and two international awards. So uh that was just some validation i was actually on to something <laughs> yeah, absolutely. well great well thank you very much for that introduction uh very comprehensive um it'd be interesting we, we always start this this podcast because it's it's about change and transformation the focus is transformation mm-hmm. uh, but we always start it with a, the same question how do you define transformation because uh, it just provides the context for what we're going to go on and talk about yeah uh, well, the first thing that I do is I make a distinction between change and transformation. And to me, change is uh, working and tweaking and adjusting an existing model yeah. and uh, making whatever improvements you can out of it. And depending upon you know, how drastically conditions have changed or how subtly they, they have uh, determines whether or not changing what you're doing is enough to continue to thrive. However, when conditions drastically change, like they have, you know, in the world over the last handful of years, uh, you, the change isn't enough. You have to transform into uh, conducting yourself and your business in, in a whole different way. So, transformation, and I've been fortunate because I've I've been through uh, a few of them, is uh, is really challenging because you're you're like the caterpillar who you go into this space where you just completely liquefy and you have to come out as something different. And it's it's not the same as the caterpillar. It's very, very different. So, you know, what, what are those processes? And uh, I've done a lot of work, a lot of research, and I've put together a, uh, a, a program around it that uh, also won me the, uh, the bronze medal for innovator of the year from the International Business Awards. And what it is, is it's based on the the philosophy that there are three things you need to do to experience a transformation. The first thing is you need a new mindset. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you need you, you need to accept the fact that the world has changed. Your world has changed. Uh and that the the way that you saw it and the way that you engaged it needs to shift. And uh I'll give an example of that. Uh, I have been uh, in recovery uh, for 10 years. So at one point, I was an alcoholic, right? <clears throat> and I had to, to be able to stop being an alcoholic. I had to, I couldn't just change what I was doing. I had to transform. Yeah. So the first thing I had to do was I had to, I had to transform mindset and change my mindset. And I had to go from alcohol is my friend. Alcohol is fun. Alcohol makes me more popular to a mindset that says alcohol is really killing me and alcohol is <laughs> hiding the fact that I'm being a jerk and irresponsible. Right. Mm-hmm. So I had to fully embrace that mindset. And, and I 
I struggled with that for about a year and a half, two years before I could do it. But once I did it, I then said, okay, I, that's how I see the world and I'm not going back. Yeah. So the next thing I need after the mindset is a new model. Like, how do I, how do I engage in the world? What do I do with my time? Right? Like I don't go to bars anymore. Uh, I would do some, I would go to the gym more. I don't hang out with the same friends. Some of the friends I, I, I just couldn't have because those relationships were based around that. So I needed new models around the friendships I have and, and how I spend my time. And then the, the third part is I need new methods. Like I need things that I do on a daily basis. You know, the mindset is kind of high level stuff. The model is uh, is mid level stuff. But the actual day to day, how do how do I live my day? The methods is really where the rubber meets the road. So to go through transformation, I need a new mindset. Yeah. I need a new model of of how I uh, engage the world, and I need new methods that I do on a daily basis. And uh, it all starts with the mindset. If you can cross over into that, then the other two have a tendency to work themselves out. So, uh, and the good news about transformation is once you get there, you don't go back. The butterfly doesn't go back to the caterpillar. Yeah. It, no. it can't. Great. I, I love that, actually. That sort of 3M model. Um, it, it, it brings it all together, doesn't it, in terms of a very relative, a very simple approach, but actually delivers significant change and significant transformation. So that you've just described that from a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly, you know, when, when I'm talking to organizations, it, it is, yeah, we can transform the organization, but the way to transform the organization is to take people on that journey. So take mm -hmm. individuals on that journey and get them going through those three stages. What 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 sort of experience and, and lessons have you learned as 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 you've been going through your many years? Um you know that 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 can that you can share that can help people who are in organizations that are going through that transformation space well you know i have uh the work that i do is really around helping organizations to go through that i call it the m3 process right uh and i use a personal story to help people get the concept, but really where I do all of my work is within organizations. So the way that applies to the organization is the people in leadership need to embrace a new mindset. And that mindset has to be that uh, it, we have to accept that the command and control top-down leadership models of the industrial age that were so successful then no longer apply in today's business world with today's workforce. We have the four most independent-minded history uh, generations in history in the workforce, and none of them want to be told what to do without having input. They all want to be empowered. So uh, that that dynamic in the workforce pushes against traditional leadership models. So the 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 leaders for today, the new mindset has to be that as a leader, I have to focus on being a great communicator, collaborator, and I'm a facilitator of the human capital, the collective genius that's around me. So my job is not to lead from the top. My job is to, you know, I designed computer networks for 20 years. So a network manager within a computer uh, network doesn't go in and tell every computer what to do. It monitors the conditions and makes sure that the conditions maximize the opportunity for the computer network to function properly. So that's the role of the leader is to constantly be looking and saying, where do I need to tweak? Uh, so the, the next thing is, is that we also really need to look at a different model on how we view our organizations. Currently, the org chart is of organizational models. Uh, and that's a problem because the org chart basically views the organization as a machine. Uh, the org chart is an assembly line. Yeah. It 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 promotes linearity, it promotes hierarchy, and it and it limits conversation. When you look at how human beings interact, uh, you know the tribe tribes are the most effective design for human collaboration ever created, and it's how we've gone from you know running from saber toothed tigers in the Serengeti to being where we are, you know the the dominant species in the world. So uh, what what I do is I have looked and I've be, I've seen that behind the org chart there are three forces that are driving performance, and those forces are tribal dynamics, 
knowledge networks, and cultures. So when the new model for the organization, I call it the organizational trinity, you still need the org chart because it says, you know, who works for whom, uh, what department they work on, et cetera. But you don't want to lead or manage through the org chart. You want to lead and manage your organization through understanding how to engage the the various tribes, uh, you know, various layers within your organization how to design teams so that they maximize their performance. And then how do you have a uh, a culture that has a high level of consciousness that basically is focused on collaboration and supporting of one another? Uh, then past that, there is uh, new models, new leadership models. And I developed an eight-part uh, leadership system that I've been doing trainings on for 15 years now. And what it does is it... Uh, I call it the bigger no principles of kind of leadership. And it's based upon the principle that as a leader, I know what I know. My team, they know what they know, but together we have a bigger no. Yeah. And it's focused on breaking down the false barriers between the front office and the front line and get that collective genius of the organization communicating. And the eight steps helps you to identify that collective genius, not get in the way of it coming out opening it up, getting it activated, and then working to heal it when it gets into conflict and to keep it healthy. Because as as leaders, our job is to maximize our human capital. Mm -hmm. Because if we maximize our human capital, the financial capital is going to show up. Financial capital is a lagging indicator of how we're handling our human capital. Money doesn't make money in organizations. People do. So I get the people side right. The money side is going to come. Uh, so those, those are the three M's that I work with organizations at the top to say, let me help, let me help you grasp this new mindset and I'll, I'll work slowly with you so you can embrace it. Let me show you the new model. I'll work slowly with you so you can embrace it. And then let me work with the methods. And it's, it's incredibly powerful. No, absolutely. And, and, and you, I think you, you know, you hit the nail on the head right at the start of that discussion there around, um, the generations that are in the workplace these days just won't accept the historical approaches to to to, to, to leadership and management. And the challenge is with some of the larger organizations that we all work with, you know, the generation that are leading those businesses are of that generation that have come from that um, um top-down approach. So there is this sort of natural um potential of conflict uh, as those those two generations sort of coming to uh, collide. You know, what 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 um what advice would you give to those you know, we're, 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 we're of similar age, sort of um middle age, grey um guys who've got sort of 25, 30, 40 years experience that are, are perhaps not as aware of some of the things that you you're talking about. What what advice, what are the two or three things that you think would 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 sort of open up the the mindset a little bit to, uh, you know, to to for them to consider. You know, one of the things that I tell them is I is I remind them that for years Gallup has done employee engagement uh, surveys, and they consistently come up with the fact that seventy percent of the people are not engaged in their work. Mm-hmm. I mean, year after year after year after year. Uh, imagine a baseball manager who could only get three of his you know, team members out on, you know, he he wouldn't win any games and he'd get fired. But it's been that way for so long. And when they survey the the employees, 70 percent want to be engaged. Yeah. So I look and I say 70 percent aren't 70 percent want want to be and you need them engaged because that's where your profitability comes from. Uh, what if I could show you a model where people would intrinsically become motivated to be more engaged so that you would have to spend less time trying to push them? Mm-hmm. And in fact, what you do is you end up changing. If you think of it energetically, you know, traditional management is <clears throat> I need to manage, I need to measure, I need to push, I need to motivate, I need to, et cetera. What if you could change that to where the energy is, the people are now intrinsically motivated to participate? How much easier would your job be? How much uh, how much stress would you reduce? And how much more fun would it be at work? And, you know, I, I mean, it's common sense that, that people want to go to work and they want to have a good day. They want to be productive. But our models prevent, our traditional models 
command and control, top-down leadership, org chart designs prevent people from wanting to be engaged. So if you change that, that'll shift. And then as a leader, you go from having to push and cajole and motivate to this energy is coming in and you get to manage and facilitate it. Uh, And and it's in our DNA to function that way. You know, this isn't woo woo. It's not a magic wand. It's just taking a look and understanding how people function uh, biologically through tribal dynamics and using those to uh, create a a leadership and management system that takes advantage of those those natural tendencies. Yeah, it's interesting that you use a sporting analogy with baseball earlier, I think, because I use them all the time. And and then, and, and the comment I, I often use is um, it's very easy in a sporting co- uh, capacity or uh, within a sports team to understand when the coach or the manager has lost, we call it the dressing room or the or the locker room. Right, right. You, you can see it on the field. People, are, you, it's very, it's much harder to see that in an organisation, but in the majority of organisations, the leader has lost the dressing room. And, and, and that's exactly what you're saying there, isn't it? It's like, like, how can you ensure that you don't lose a dressing room? And actually the dressing room and the team are really driving to make you, the business, you, their performance, uh, the, 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 be- the best it can be. You know, and I tell people my age, I'm 66, I'm a boomer. Uh, and I was raised in the old way. <clears throat> and I tell people, look, whether whether you like it or not, The conditions have changed such that the balance of power between employee and employer has drastically changed forever. Now, you can fight against that and you can push harder and you can be more demanding and you will see an accelerated decline. You you will experience uh, what a friend of mine calls madness. And MAD is an acronym for Managed Accelerated Decline. So, you know, you got to face the reality and say, this isn't, th- these are new generations and they're, they're not fighting against you. They're fighting to be expressive and innovation and creation and, and creative. So take advantage of that energy and, and move your ego aside. A lot of the work that I do is to help people uncover parts of their ego that are working against them. Mm-hmm. We don't, the ego is not bad it is what it is, but it can really work against you and you have things in your blind spot. So, uh, you know, that's that's one of the things that I, I really stress is, look, the reality has changed. And as leaders, we need to be adaptive. Yeah. If we can, we'll build really vibrant organizations and next generation leadership teams that the company will go and go. Uh, like, you know, the old one that I had, it's been, geez, I, I sold it and it's been 18 years and it's still going. Yeah. Uh, so it's not because I'm in there working it, but we built a foundation and a culture. Yeah. that is continuing so uh yeah it's really important that that, that people face that uh yeah and, and i think otherwise it, fun. no absolutely I, and, and i think um, it goes back to a, a conversation i had uh on on an earlier episode uh the difference as, as a leader um the difference in mindset and approach by if you focus on outcomes rather than inputs and outputs so, you know, you, mm-hmm. as, a, as an organization, as a leader of an organization or, or a program lead or a transformation lead, you're looking to deliver certain outcomes, whatever those are, that the end vision, the North Star. You can, lots of people call it lots of different things. But let's let's focus upon that as opposed to focusing upon the inputs, because there have been many ways of getting to that end point. And if you can open up and be cognizant of the creativity within your team and within the uh, uh, within the wider the, the wider network that you, you operate within, there may be a lot a lot quicker way of getting to that to those outcomes. So be clear about the outcomes, and as a leader, your role is to get absolute clarity on those outcomes, but be less concerned about the inputs. and And it's that I suppose it links back to micromanagement or the whole, the old style of management, isn't mm-hmm. it? It's almost throw it up in the air and 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 and. Uh, and completely rethink how you how you how would go about your day to day activities. So um, yeah, and it, you know, so go. No, I was just going to say a, a couple of things around the mindset stuff. If if you can get the mindset right, a lot of these other things will just kind of start happening. One is shift the mindset of you as a leader to being you as a tribal elder. Yeah. Or organizations are a tribe of tribes. And if you see yourself as a tribal elder, 
you will automatically see your responsibility and how you ga- engage the people in your organization differently. And that increase in connectivity will be felt and they will res- they will respond to it. And the other thing is to stop looking at your organization as a machine. You know, we talk about we're going to build our organization. Organizations are organisms. Mm. They are living, breathing, biological entities. And you need to look at how can you grow that? So you grow something is you nurture it, you feed it, you support it, you water it, you prune it, (laughs) you know, you prune the weeds and you prune it so it's extra growth. But if you can see yourself as a tribal elder and those people that work with you as somebody that you're really responsible for and and they're depending upon you to, to, to do things right. And then to start seeing your organization as as an organism, not a machine. Those two things by themselves will will give you some tools you could use starting tomorrow that yeah. will start to shift how you engage your people. Interesting, interesting. So you you were saying earlier about um, there's eight methods that you you look to to implement. Mm-hmm. Can you can you just yeah. share a couple of those? Sure. It's a uh, you know think of a circle. Yeah. And uh, the top is the first principle is there is a bigger no. Yeah. And wh- what I do in my training is I, I help everybody to realize that there's a collective genius in your organization that is way smarter than you will ever be. Yeah. And with that, with that collective genius, there's an energy that will come with it. So that is your most valuable resource. You want to do everything you can to activate the bigger no. The next one is, well, if it's always there, why isn't it always present? And it's because egos get in and block it, right? right? So if you're, if you're working with me and I have a big ego, I keep going and shutting you down after a while, you're just going to stop engaging me. So the next step is I call it domesticate your dog because egos are like dogs, right? They're they're fine, but if they're not domesticated, they bark, they bite, they sniff in inappropriate places. And one barking dog will activate other dogs to bark, just like one ego activates other egos. And that breaks down your access, that collective genius. The next step is, okay, so how do I open that network? And this is a really challenging one. Uh, and it's uh, ask and invite questions, then listen. As leaders, we're used to talking and telling. We feel this big responsibility. I got to be the tip of the spear. And to a degree you do, but you also want to engage that network. People want to participate. So that's the third principle. Uh, The next principle is, you know, you're going to get some information that that comes up. And so what do you do with it? You want to assess that information, not judge the information you're getting or the person. Because when people feel judged, they shut down, you lose access to the bigger no. The next thing is, okay, well, people are going to put some things out and uh, not all of it works. What do I do with it then to not shut them down? And it's to coach, don't criticize. Yeah. And that's how you build the network. If you're off on something, I'm not going to I'm not going to criticize you for it. I'm going to help you see what it is, and I'm going to coach you up to the next level. Uh, after that, that's kind of how you open it up and build it. And then the next step is when you start having conflicts in organizations, because when you get a vibrant network going, uh, there's going to be uh, some passion in there. And when disagreements come up, you focus on seeking alignment yeah. over agreements. Uh, and then after that, it is uh, it gets a little bit deeper and uh, for the leader on how to be really committed to building an organization, uh, but without being emotionally detached, attached to it. So the principle is be committed, but detached. And that's where it really gets gets tricky. Uh, and then the last one is there are no failures, there's only lessons. And that's all about resilience organizational healing and helping people move together as a group so that you keep your group cohesive. So you're activating the collective genius. You're getting it working for you. You're going in, you're working it through its upsets. And then you you're building this culture of forgiveness and every, uh, every unintended consequence is an opportunity to learn and grow. And that's good for the group. Really, 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 really simplistic. In, in 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 the approach and, and very easy to understand I, I can absolutely imagine just the the level of detail that's beneath each, each one of those things but it, it's interesting you ended up uh, with the final one saying uh, there's no failures there's only lessons and uh, I want to bring you right back to the start of, of the conversation where you're saying your first business 
seven years in, mm. it had grown to a point where it, it it sounded like it had just got to a stage where it's it was hard to control <laughs> because you'd 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 hit that ceiling of your knowledge and experience as a team. So so what were the key lessons that you took from that experience that made the second business that you did so successful? I think the biggest one was that no one can ever make me give up. Right. I mean, I I got to a point where it was like, okay, well, the, the business is going to go down, but I don't have to give up, mm. right? Uh, and that was very empowering for me. I can choose not to do something, yeah. right? I can look and go, I, I just don't want to have this life anymore. I could have chosen to to get a job, but that's not me giving up. That's me choosing, a yeah. making another choice, right? The other thing was to uh, focus on doing a better job of managing my cash flow and being more aware of it. And you don't have to be a financial wizard to do that. If you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you can you can manage your cash flow. Uh, and I think the third thing is that uh, just really look to tap into the collective genius of the people around you because I didn't have money when I started my next company. I, I had $17,000 and I was going to run out of that in, in six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so a friend of mine said, you're insane to start this business. And I said, okay, so I'm insane. <laughs> uh, but what helped me to get through that was I was an expert at maximizing my human capital. So I had people have faith in what we were doing. I built a team and and we saw ourselves as a, as a company that was small, but we were going to make it. So valuing human capital over financial capital yeah. is a lesson that I have carried with me. Uh, geez, oh, that, that business went under in 87 and I've carried that with me ever since. And it's the basis of all the work that I do is helping people to maximize their, their human capital. Uh, so yeah, Cash flow, nobody can ever make me give up. That's the ultimate empowerment thing. And human capital is far more value than financial capital. Yeah. It, you it, need the money, obviously. Yeah. But but it's it, it's interesting as well that that wait again, that your your initial response there was the uh, that mindset. You you it was your choice. And and you know, you could choose to go and get take a job or you could choose to go and um, uh, give it another go with a business. You, you didn't you didn't feel restricted just because of that perceived failure behind you it was it was a it was a lesson that you could take into your next next time it's it i'm just wondering whether there's a cultural difference here uh between uk and and and, and us i think in, in 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 the uk there is this um well my perception from talking to lots of people and reading lots of things is that uh, you know, in, in the US, it's almost a lot of businesses or business people, entrepreneurs, it's like they they become massively successful after the second or third failure. So it's almost let's get the let's get the failures out of the way so I can be successful. Where in the UK, it's well if I'm if I, if I failed, then I can't really I'm I'm, I'm a failure, and 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 I think there is. It'd be interesting to get your views on the subtle differences on that sort of mindset and that approach and that culture, I suppose. Well, you know, I think that it's in the uh, the DNA of Americans. And I think it's unfortunately it's getting less and less because we're becoming more and more dependent on government. Right. But uh, entrepreneurialism, pioneership is in our is in our DNA. You know, our government was initially designed to to inspire that and create that because we needed entrepreneurs. You know, all the immigrants that came over here, they weren't the lazy people. Yeah. They were people who wanted a better life and they were willing to leave absolutely everything behind them, cross an ocean and wooden ships. Oh my God. You know, we complain if we have a four hour plane ride with an hour delay, right? I mean, these were tough people and they came out and they uh, they did their best and some made it and, and, and some didn't. But that's really in our that that's in our DNA. And I think that uh, that is maybe where part of the cultural difference comes in. And, and one of the concerns that I have being a, a serial entrepreneur and somebody who who loves that energy is that I'm afraid that, you know, uh, big government is, government always looks to get bigger. 
And, you know, there's a, there's a fundamental battle that goes on on a universal scale, which is institutions versus the individual. Yeah. The in, there's a huge battle on who's going to get the resources of the individual. Uh, you know, governments don't make money. They have to get it from the individual. So they constantly are looking as they want to grow to uh, get more resources of the individual. So they legislate things and increase taxes and we have to pay for it. And uh, it's fascinating to me. I'm a bit of a futurist as I look and I see what's happening. Uh, institutions are really getting aggressive on controlling the individuals and the individuals, uh, because there are these independent generations out there, they're, they're feeling the rub and they're pushing against it. Uh, and it's fascinating to see how that's playing out. But yeah, in the US, you know, you, you, you fail in a business and you, you, you get th those who go into it. Oftentimes it, it takes you a couple of times at the plate before you could start, you yeah. know, hitting some singles and doubles. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting, again, um, just touching on um, what you were saying around um, the changing dynamics. You know, we find in, in any change and transformation process, most people, whether you are leading it or whether or not you are receive, in receipt of it uh, and, 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 and being taken through that sort of change journey, it can be quite stressful. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure there's been periods in, in your 44-year career uh, uh, you know, especially when you're going through 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 some of those sort of um, uh, fast growth sort of phases within your businesses, that there was quite a lot of stress around. Uh, we're always conscious of of trying to help people, so it'd be good again. Just just if, if you've got a couple of tips on how you manage your stress that someone else can maybe maybe take as a as a as a, as a best better practice. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> the stress that I experienced as that business was crashing it was about a year, year and a half. You know, we kept trying to pull it up so that so the plane wouldn't hit the mountain. And then on the other side of that, my second business really struggled for about nine years. I probably went under four or five times during that. Uh, I had cancer and stage four cancer in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, I went through a divorce. You know, so like all this stuff. And there were days when I would like, especially Sunday evenings, I would almost throw up nice. because knowing the stress I was entering into the next day. And <clears throat> it was really, really challenging. And what I would do with myself is I would just say, okay, how am I doing now? Yeah. Right now in this moment, how am I? Because I had to get some some level of of safety. Uh, the other thing was I would have a mantra that says, I win. Right. I win no matter what. And, you know, obviously I'm I'm looking and I'm seeing, you know, that the train is coming. So I'm not in la la land. Yeah. But one of the things that I would do when I was really under a stressful environment, and I did this when my business was going under, was I would look and say, okay, let me go into worst case scenario. Yeah. Business crashes. I lose my house. Uh, I have a wife. I have a, two kids. What am I going to do? And I would go into that and I would look and say, okay, because if my business crashes, I don't die. So I have to do something on the other side of it. So I would spend time and it was really challenging. Look at what that, that worst case is and what would I do around that? And in that case, it would be my wife and kids would go back to New Jersey and live with her parents. And I would live like in my car until I could rebuild something. Right. But the reason I did that is because I wanted to have that solution in my mind so that when I'm out there and I'm working and all of a sudden those boo birds come in, those scary thoughts that go, boo, you're going under. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. What I would do is I would say, wait a minute. I've already thought about what I would do with that. And I'd put that solution in a box and I'd like put it up on a mental shelf. So when, oh, my God, I might go under and that fear can paralyze me, I would just look and say, well, I know what I'll do. So I don't have to focus on that. Let me focus on what can I do to prevent that from happening? Yeah. So yeah. thinking about worst case, then putting it in a box and putting it on a shelf can help you uh, withstand those big waves of fear that come in that say, what if this happens? Uh, absolutely. And, and um that reminds me of um, a decision-making tool that I was introduced to many years ago, and it's a similar sort of principle. If you've got a decision to take, think about and consider the worst-case scenario. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you accept that worst-case scenario? If you can, 
say, 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 say agree to go move forward on it because you've right. accepted it. And you, you, so the worst, you, the, wor- the worst it can happen, you've accepted. So at least mm-hmm. then you've got the foundations on which to move forward on. And, mm-hmm. and it was that, again, it's a mindset thing coming back to the, the very, very early stage of this conversation. Everything's in here, isn't it, in, in your head. And, and the more you can get yourself in that right frame of mind. And I, I was fascinated to hear when you were saying, come back to the moment, be in the mm-hmm. present. Because it's it's scary when you look too far in the future, right. and it's waste time looking too far in the in the past. Just be present, and actually, are you okay now? Fine, mm. let's move forward that first step, and then you can take the second step and the third step. You know, another thing I learned, and this came to me through the cancer experience, was I would ask myself, "What class am I in?" Right. So uh, when when I feel as though life is beating the daylights out of me, I can. It's natural to kind of feel like a victim. Like, look at all this stuff that's happening to me. And with cancer, it was so important that I had a winner's mindset because that really determines which way your cancer is going in a lot of cases. So what I had to do was uh, I had to look and say, why is cancer here? Cancer is a teacher for me. It's, I mean, it could be a killer, but I'm, I'm going to frame it as a teacher. Mm. So if I'm going to pay that price, if I'm going to pay that tuition, I'm going to ace the class. So what I do is I look and I say, okay, what, what class am I in? So any big challenge that I'm having that I start to feel like, oh, I'm getting my butt kicked again. I just look and go, oh, wait a minute. The universe doesn't hate me. The universe supports me. So what class am I in? What can I learn out of this? And that's, that's part of what the eighth principle and the bigger no principles about is there are no failures, only lessons. So right away, and and you can use this for anything that's going on. The minute you say, what class am I in? You actually shift the consciousness at which you're looking at the problem from. You go from looking at it as your ego, as your, your, your thinking mind to this higher we all have an inner elder within us that exists. It's very quiet. It's very wise. And the mind just kind of overruns it. But the minute you say, what class am I in? That allows you to take the position of the observer. And that observer gives you clarity, helps you get out of the emotion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the more the more emotion we have, the less intellect we have, the less clarity we have. Yeah, so no. just that single question helps raise you up to that next level. And then you can start to make sense of things. You make sense of things. You go, oh, I, I'm in this thing. Of, I have to learn how to go through this experience without it owning me. Yeah. And it, once you go through the experience and you get the lesson, it doesn't have a tendency to come back again. Yeah. So everything's an opportunity to empower yourself. I love that. I love that approach. Uh, it's not, I've not come across it before uh, in, in, that, in that context, in the way that you framed it. I love that. Um, I'll definitely use that. Yeah, what class am I in? It's huge, very powerful. Yeah, we we uh, we we end these with the one question: What is your one takeaway? But I think I've just got that. That, that was that was a brilliant <laughs> way of bringing bringing the podcast to to an end. So thank you very much, Jeffrey. It was a great session. Loved every minute of it. I think there's so much that people can take and, and apply to life whether they're in business, whether they're in organizations, whether they're working through change and transformation. So it's been been really useful. Thank you very much. I've really, en- I really enjoy talking about this because there are so many things that I've learned that I know can help other people. And that's what I'm here for is to help as many people as I can. And uh, what class am I in? It's We're just in one big school room down here. Yeah, <laughs> and- absolutely. Once again, thank you very much. And uh, speak to you very soon. Thank you. Jeffrey, once again, thank you very much. If you're interested in finding out more about Jeffrey, check out his website, jeffreydeckman.com. I trust that you find this episode of interest. If you have, please do share your comments and please do subscribe and share your thoughts on the podcast as a whole so that we can spread the word and get the message out to as many people as possible. The podcast goes hand in hand with the approach that we take within the Transformation Leaders Hub, a community focused exclusively on those operating within change and transformation. So if you've not checked it out as yet, please do so today by clicking on the link in the show notes. I look forward to sharing another episode with you in a couple of weeks time. So bye for now.